Hello, my name is Martin Scuffins and uh, I'm from the Lee Valley Hawk and Owl Sanctuary. This is Pickle, I'm going to talk about her in just a minute. It's an absolute pleasure to be here with the uh, Melton Lifelong Learning Festival and to talk about my pet subject, so to speak, which is uh, birds of prey. And I've been working with birds of prey for many, many years now. In fact, uh, the first bird that I trained for hunting was when I was about eight years old. That particular bird, um, she was a Muscovy duck. And uh, I was so obsessed with this ancient sport of falconry that I trained this Muscovy duck to sit on my arm and act like a hunting falcon. It didn't work out very well. Nowadays, I specialize in spending my time with these remarkable and amazing predatory birds, the birds of prey. We also know them as raptors. Raptor is a Latin word, and it means to seize a hold of something and carry it away. And this is a little bit of an indication of how these remarkable little predators live their lives. They do most of their hunting with their feet. So one of the most important adaptations of birds of prey is their feet. They have three toes facing forwards and one toe facing back. And each toe has a very, very sharp claw, which we know as a talon. And as it happens, I have a talon here with me. I'll just reach down to my prop box and I'll pull out my talon. This is a talon, a replica talon from a golden eagle. And you can see how long and how sharp that is. Ooh, you wouldn't want to be grabbed by one of these birds. Their feet have about 250 pounds of pressure per square inch. So when an animal is grabbed by a, an eagle or a hawk or a falcon or a bird of prey, it's almost impossible for that animal to escape. And inside those toes are tendons which are designed like a ratchet mechanism. So when they grab their prey, the feet are literally closing and locking in position. Pickle here's got her toes very tightly locked on my glove here at the moment. And these talons are driven in to their prey very, very deeply indeed. And it's almost impossible for that animal to escape. So that word raptor, a Latin word for to seize a hold of something and carry it away is an indication of how these birds actually hunt. Having grabbed a hold of their prey, they then use their sharp beak to finish it off. Pickles being very, very gentle with me here now. Um, that beak though is very powerful and capable of great damage. So what I have here is a replica skull of a golden eagle and uh, this uh, gives you a bit of an indication of how big and how powerful that incredible hooked beak is. The sides of the beak of the mandibles are actually quite sharp, a bit like a knife, but perhaps the most important aspect is this point here, this tip of the beak which is used for um, killing the prey once it's been subdued with those very, very powerful teeth, uh, those powerful feet and sharp talons. This is all very well and good. They have very large, powerful feet for catching their prey and they have a beak to finish them off once they've caught them. But first, they have to find them. So perhaps one of the most important adaptations of birds of prey is their eyesight. Look how big those eyes are. And when we have our birds out, you'll be able to see how large the eyes of a bird of prey are. Well, eagles have eyes which are about um, as big as a human eye, about the same size as a human eye. Proportionally, uh, compared to their skulls, they're much larger. So if we had eyes that were the same size proportionally as an eagle, our eyes would be the size of oranges. They take up about 40 to 50% of the skull. These very large eyes let in a lot of light, just like a camera lens, and that enables the bird to see very long distances. In fact, an eagle, when it's looking for its prey, can see a rabbit from one and a half kilometers away. We can see a rabbit from about half a kilometer away. So roughly speaking, their eyesight is three times better and more powerful than our own eyesight. The largest bird of prey in Australia is the wedge-tailed eagle. And I have a wing feather here from the left wing from a wedge-tailed eagle. And uh, the largest eagle ever measured, depending on who you believe, had a wingspan of approximately 2.3 meters. That's wingtip to wingtip, 2.3 meters. Now compare that to an Andean condor, and it's somewhat smaller. An Andean condor is the largest bird of prey on the face of the planet. They have a wingspan of 3.35 meters, but the wedge-tailed eagle is pretty big at 2.3 meters, wingtip to wingtip. If the bird's flying into the sun, it's only about half that 
because the bird has to fly with one wing held like this. That joke is very hard to do with a bit of prey on your fist. Not very fair is it pickle and not very funny, sorry about that. So the wedge-tailed eagle is a very, very large bird of prey. Not the biggest eagle on earth, but certainly has the longest wingspan of any eagle on earth. Now the bird I'm holding here is, as you can see, a much smaller bird than the wedge-tailed eagle. She's a species of falcon and uh, we have six falcon species in Australia. The smallest is the little Australian kestrel and I'm going to talk about that bird a little more very shortly. But first of all, this bird here is an Australian hobby. Her name is Pickle and she's a female. She's about four years old and uh, she's a bird hunter. So this is one of the top guns of the bird world. Falcons are very much ad adapted for speed, high speed flight. So Pickle here has long pointed wings. In fact, her scientific name is Falco longa penes. That means long feathers. She has these long sickle shaped wings. Falco is a Latin word meaning sickle shaped. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to give Pickle something to eat. And uh, what I'm going to feed her is actually another bit of bird, like a bit of chicken, but it's quail, very gourmet for pickle today. Obviously she can't eat at the moment because she's wearing a hood, she can't see. That hood just keeps her quiet while she's traveling to and from displays and for this kind of work. So the hood will just keep her quiet and until I'm ready for her to appear, I'm now ready for her to have something to eat and to say hello to us. So I'm gonna put the food, which is a quail wing, into my glove. She knows something's happening. She knows there's food there. And I'll take this hood off. Hoods are a very ancient piece of technology. These have been used on falcons for hundreds and hundreds of years. And in fact, uh, they were falconry, the sport of hunting with these birds was so popular in the Middle Ages that many of the terms and the words and the vocabulary associated with this sport have found their way into our language. So if you've ever been hoodwinked, guess where that came from? From these falcons wearing a hood. So there's Pickle eating her food. I'm just gonna pop that down there. And uh, she's gonna hold it down firmly with those feet, those long bird grasping toes, and she's going to tear at the meat with her beak. You'll notice that she has very dark colored eyes. The dark eyes of a falcon act like sunglasses and help them to hunt when they're in open country. So a very important adaptation for an active hunting bird that hunts in open country. These little, uh, little hobbies are very, very maneuverable. In fact, um, they've been observed catching dragonflies on the wing. So extremely fast and agile flyers and a common resident of our cities and towns because they like to eat small birds. And when you're walking around Melton or or walking around Melbourne or any other city, you're likely to see a lot of sparrows and starlings around. So that attracts hobbies into urban areas. Sadly, they often have accidents as a result. Common accidents for hobbies include hitting glass windows. Birds don't understand glass. So sometimes they will concuss themselves on glass windows, flying into power lines, and also being struck by moving vehicles. So an urban environment can be a productive environment for a little Australian hobby like Pickle here, but unfortunately it's also a dangerous one. And you will notice with Pickle, um, probably a bit hard with her um, dodgy wing on this side, but if I turn around, you may notice that her right wing hangs a little bit lower than her left wing. And that's because Pickle had an accident. We think that she was struck by a car and she broke that wing. And unfortunately, she'll never be a perfect flyer as a result. So um, consequently, she's a useful education bird, but would probably not survive in the wild due to that slight flight impairment. I do fly her and uh, she's pretty good. She flies at about 80% of the capacity of a wild hobby. And in fact, I can categorically say because she's worn a GPS, while we were flying her one day and her personal best in terms of uh, speed in the air was 101 kilometers an hour. So she's pretty quick. Okay, so hobbies are very intelligent little birds and um, at the Lee Valley Hawk and Owl Sanctuary we try and train our birds to do everything voluntarily wherever possible. 
The hood is very useful because it keeps the bird calm. So if you need to take it to the vet or you want to go out flying and the bird has to ride in the car, like Pickle does, then uh, the hood helps keep them calm. So I've trained Pickle to more or less put it on herself and you'll notice as I hold it out that she will lean forward and even put her own head voluntarily into the hood. There we go. So that's on and now Pickle is ready to go home. The smallest species of falcon in Australia is the Australian or Nankeen kestrel. And uh, now I'd like to introduce to you Jeddah, the Australian kestrel. And as she flies, you'll notice that she's got some beautiful adaptations for her way of life. For example, she has a very, very long tail, a long fan-shaped tail. That's her rudder and her brake. The Australian kestrel is the world's master of hovering flight. This is the type of bird that you frequently see over grasslands. And uh, when it's hovering in the air, it's able to maintain a very, very steady position. In fact, studies have shown with Jeddah and one of our other kestrels in a wind tunnel at RMIT, we've managed to demonstrate that they're able to hover in a 30 kilometer an hour turbulent wind with only one millimeter of head displacement. So they really are the world's master of hovering flight. Now, kestrels have amazing superpowers. Not only can they fly, not only can they hover, but they have some more superpowers to, uh, to hunt the kind of animals that they like to hunt as well. Um, in fact, they're specialists of hunting other animals on the ground. The hobby hunts airborne prey, other birds. Kestrels occasionally might catch another bird, but more, more often it's going to be things like mice on the ground or skinks or maybe um, insects, large insects like grasshoppers and crickets are also a favorite prey of the Australian kestrel. And to catch those, they'll hover. So any point in the sky is a pot potential vantage point from which they can hunt. And then they bring in their other superpowers into play. So one of their amazing superpowers is the ability to see ultraviolet. So when a mouse runs around on the ground, it leaves a trail behind it of urine. And that sounds a bit gross to us, but that's the roadmap for the mouse. When the mouse wants to go home, it turns itself around and starts smelling its way down its own urine trail to get home. It's a roadmap that finds its way home in that way. But for a kestrel, it can see the urine trail actually glowing in the ultraviolet light. So in the presence of ultraviolet light, that urine trail becomes visible to a kestrel. It's a treasure map for the kestrel. They follow it and hopefully find the mouse and a good meal at the end of that urine trail. So that's one superpower. Second superpower is that the kestrel is able to see a lot more movement than our human eyes are able to detect. So for example, when we watch television, we actually watch around about 25 frames per second. And uh, what this means is that's a moving image to us. Our eye is unable to detect 25 still images every second and therefore uh, television, motion pictures all work in terms of us watching them. But a kestrel can detect between 80 and 100 movements per second. So when they watch television, what they see is a slideshow of individual images. So an action film for a kestrel is a PowerPoint presentation. Imagine how boring action films are for these birds. They just don't get it at all. Common accidents for kestrels, being hit by cars because they hunt around roadsides. They're very productive places. Often there's grassland where they like to hunt. And another problem for them, occasionally they'll eat a mouse that might have eaten a rodent poison. So if you'd like to help kestrels, a couple of ways you can help them. One way is to slow down on country roads, and another way is to uh, stop using rodent poison and start using snap traps to get rid of mice and rats around your house whenever possible. That's gonna help them enormously. So the little Australian hobby is uh, a bird catcher. The Nankeen or Australian kestrel is uh, a catcher of mice, rodents and skinks, small animals on the ground. There's also a nocturnal shift that I would like to introduce to you today. And that nocturnal bird, which loves to eat mice, is the beautiful Australian barn owl. 
Now the barn owl is a cosmopolitan species. That means it's found all over the world except Antarctica. We used to say except Antarctica in New Zealand, but recently they even managed to colonise New Zealand. It's a heck of a long way to fly, isn't it, from Australia to New Zealand? It's possible they hitched a ride on ships, we're not completely sure, but they have turned up in New Zealand, so they're found all over the world now. Now the barn owl is a specialised nocturnal hunter of rodents. If there are no mice or rats available, the bird won't starve. It will turn its attention to small birds, large insects, maybe a gecko, gecko or a lizard or something of the sort. But generally they prefer to eat rodents, so they're a very, very useful bird for us to have around. In order to hunt these rodents, they have a range of specialised adaptations. Now the first and most important thing is that um, when hunting at night, good nocturnal vision is very important. So again, just like the eagle I mentioned at the beginning, owls have very, very large eyes. In fact, they're bigger proportionally than the eyes of an eagle. So if you compare them to the size of the skull, if we had eyes that were as large as an owl's eyes, our eyes would be the size of grapefruit. And imagine how crazy we'd look with grapefruit-sized eyes. Very, very large eyes indeed. They can't see in colour like the kestrel or the hobby can, but they can see a lot more grey tones and a lot more in the grey scale than we human beings are able to detect with our eyes. And if there's just a tiny bit of starlight, um, a nice bit of moonlight, even street light or the, the, the lights of a, a city or a suburb, the owl is able to hunt by that light that's available that enables it to see its prey. If none of that is available, there's no moon, no starlight, no street lights, then the owl can't see, but they can still hunt. How do they do this? It's quite amazing. Well, you'll notice with the barn owl that it has a heart-shaped face. That heart-shaped facial disc of feathers is like a parabola, a satellite dish. It's like having a satellite dish on your head, except it catches sound. The sound is caught by that facial disc, directed into the ears, which are asymmetrical. So one ear, kind of up here on the skull, up on the, the right hand side, um, it's higher. On the left hand side, it's a little lower. So the ears are asymmetrical, although it's impossible for us to see this because the ears are hidden underneath their feathers. Um, these asymmetrical ears actually catch the sound a fraction of a second apart and the result of this is the bird can triangulate. Uh, it can hear left and right and up and down. And so if a mouse is rustling through dry grass, the owl will hear this, turn its head in that direction and will be able to pounce on the mouse and catch it even though that owl is in complete darkness. It's a pretty amazing form of adaptation with our hearing, that they're able to hear left and right and up and down and triangulate and locate their prey in complete darkness. Now, a problem with the owl's eyes is that because they're so large, because they're the size of, you know, grapefruit if they had a skull our size, very large eyes, 50% of the skull is taken over by vision, they're locked in place. So an owl is incapable of going cross-eyed. An owl will never be able to pull a crazy face because it's not able to go cross-eyed or move its eyes individually in the head in the way that we human beings are able to do. So to make up for this, they have a very flexible neck. And you may notice on our barn owl, who by the way, her name is Alkina. Alkina is able to turn her head around a very long way. In fact, she's capable of moving her head on a rotation of 270 degrees. So not quite 360, not all the way around, but she can turn her head around 270 degrees. She has twice as many vertebrae in her neck um, as we do, so don't try this at home. You probably hurt yourself. Now a major problem for owls, first and foremost, rodent poison is a huge danger to these birds. So again, if you can change to snap traps in your own homes, instead of using um, rodent poisons, that's gonna help these birds to survive in future. A study in Western Australia came up with several individuals of, of southern bubble cow that uh, had up to five different varieties of rodent poison in their bodies around the city of Perth. So we need to do something to become better neighbors for these birds. So change to snap traps, don't use rodent poison, slow down on country roads, and also if you possibly can learn what to do if you find an injured bird, bird of prey, or really any injured wildlife. 
The first thing with birds is, some people will find an injured bird and they'll pick it up and they'll put it into a wire cage. Please never put a wild injured bird into a wire cage. It's likely to thrash around and damage its feathers and also cause injuries to its face. Um, it will be stimulated by everything you can see around it and try and escape. A cardboard box is ideal. So if you find an injured bird of prey or another injured native bird on the ground, throw a blanket over it or a towel or a jacket or a jumper, pick it up, put it into a cardboard box. Having secured it in, in that way, and obviously if it's a wedge-tailed eagle, you're gonna need some help. So maybe skip this stage if it's an injured wedge-tailed eagle, otherwise you might end up hurt. Um, having contained the bird in a box, you can do a couple of things. Wildlife Victoria is a very useful organisation to call and you'll find their number on the internet. From memory it is 8400 7300. I'm 99% sure that's correct. Wildlife Victoria 8400 uh, 7300 and they will direct you or get a volunteer to come and collect the bird. You need a permit to care for an injured um, native animal or bird if you do happen to find one. If you can't get a hold of, of Wildlife Victoria, then um, try, try your local vet. Usually local vets will have um, a list of wildlife shelters or carers that can then look after the animal. Take very careful note of where it was found so that it can be released later on and it can go back into its own territory or back to its own parents. That's very important. Sometimes vets forget to ask that, but if you could write down where the bird was found, that would be an enormous help. Most importantly, if we want to look after little birds and animals like pickle, um, many of which have become endangered through uh, the activities of, of human beings, then there is one very good way of doing it, and that's to look after the habitat on which they depend. Wildlife is now living cheek by jowl with an ever increasing human population, and many of them are not faring too well as a result. If we want to look after these animals, if we want our grandchildren to be able to experience just how beautiful and magnificent the beautiful little Australian hobby is, or the wedge-tailed eagle, we need to look after the natural environment on which they depend. And to finish up, I'm going to give you a little bit of a, a maths equation. Let's call it algebra. That's another really bad joke, by the way. Algebra. Species minus habitat equals extinction. It really is that simple. Take away the habitat of these animals and they will disappear forever. And uh, no doubt our world will become a less happy place and a sadder place in which to live. Thank you very much for, uh, for listening to me today and I uh, hope you've enjoyed meeting our three beautiful birds, Pickle the Australian Hobby, Jeddah the Australian Kestrel and Alkina the Barn Owl. And it's been an absolute pleasure to be here as a part of the Melton Lifelong Learning Festival. Thank you very much.